Hello everyone. Thank you very much for having me today. Since this session is pre-recorded, there is a great possibility that I will be able to chat with you while you are watching it. I'm Damir and I'm from Croatia. For many years I was a developer, mostly programming ESP.NET using C Sharp. I was also using many other technologies, starting from ASP Vanilla, WinForms, Clarion, Oracle, Oracle Forms, etc. I started to use SQL Server from version 2000. Through 15 plus years of my professional experience, I oriented myself in MS SQL Server development and optimization. Last eight years, I'm working for a great company named Span, and my current position is Senior Database Developer. For more than two years, I'm leading the creation SQL Server user group. In 2019, with some friends, I organized the first SQL Saturday in Croatia. Also, I am a co-founder of Data Weekend Conference. I am writing my blog about MS SQL. This year, Microsoft rewarded me with the MVP status for my contribution to the community. I speak on various conferences and events. What improvements since SQL Server 2019? 16, sorry, to date, have been introduced on functions related to string manipulation. For a start, we will go over what has been improved in that regard. In addition, there are some news related to other segments, some of which we will study later. This session is related to some new functions and features and not strictly about performance tuning enhancements. String Let's jump on the table value of function is introduced in SQL Server version 2016 for splitting string values via separator. It has multiple usages. For example, you can use it for input parameter of a store procedure. The function returns a single column table with parts or fragments. The name of the column is value. Return type depends on any of the input arguments. So, n varchar or n char returns like n varchar. All other data types are returned as varchar. The table value function can be used not only in the select statement to get results, but also in where or from, like join or cross apply. From my experience, I know that there are many theories, approaches, and solutions to split strings in SQL Server before the existence of string split function. The one I prefer is using XML. If you want to read more about different methods and benchmarks, of course, for splitting strings, I suggest you to take a look at the good article by Aaron Bertrand on sqlperformance.com. String escape escapes special characters by escaping rule. You can use any rule you like while this rule is JSON. Since SQL Server 2016 introduced JSON support, it was logical to introduce also string escape. Forward message statement is enhanced in SQL Server 2016. To accept a message string argument, meaning you can use your own string to build a message. If you are also a developer like me, maybe your dream was to be able to format and concatenate strings in SQL Server easily, like you can do it in some programming languages like C Sharp. In C Sharp, for example, for this purpose, you can use the string format method. Let's jump on the first set of demos. Let's try to get all the ingredients for a mojito cocktail separated by comma using string split. Of course, we will get one column with all the values. Let's see what happened if we have two separators but no string in between of them. We will get an empty string, of course. The third example, we will try to use two characters for a separator. And this is not supported in SQL Server function string split. We can, for example, use string split to parse JSON document. 
<clears throat> but first we must of course replace JSON tags. And this is the example of that. So imagine we want to use string split with an input variable, for example, for a stock procedure. We get stock items IDs in the list, like an input parameter, and then let retrieve all invoices ID containing these stock items IDs. And this is the result. Let's create a function for splitting strings using XML like before, before the existence of string split. Let's see how it's working. It's working pretty well. And now let's compare this old approach of splitting, split, splitting strings with the new string split function. I will run both queries. The result is the same. If you look at the messages, we will see that the first query was not so efficient like the second one. It takes 15 milliseconds of CPU time. The second one takes zero. And of course, it was also using a temporary table. If you look at the execution plan, you will see that the first query used 64% and the second one only 36 So string split is really efficient. Let's see string escape. So like I told you before, string escape is for escaping strings by any rule while the rule must be JSON. So this is a valid JSON string with escapes characters. Control characters are escaped in a special way. You have backslash U and the code of this character. What will happen if we try to escape the null value? We will, of course, get null. Now let's see the format message. This first example is an old way to do concatenation of strings. So you have the plus, the variable, and some strings. Now let's make the things a little bit complicated. So we also want to have a number, of course. The number must be, of course, casted if you want to achieve the result. But what if one variable is, for example, null? So you have a complication because the null plus something is always null. So now we have a bulletproof proof solution of the problem. So I must check for every variable if it is null and then replace it with string value. Of course, I must also use cast. And this is not so great. So let's see the format message function. So it's working pretty well. I have the format message. I have placeholders. And I have variables that I won't put in these placeholders, of course. And these placeholders can support different data types. For example, these are all strings. But still, the cast is required. And this gives us the result. But what happens if we have null value, like before? Let's try it, of course. And null is casted as this. So you will not get the whole result null, but only the null value will be included. And this is a funny example of to get drop statement for every table in the database using format message. Of course, don't do this in production. Welcome back. Trim is a new MS SQL Server function introduced from SQL Server 2017. It removes space character from both sides of the string. 
at the beginning left and the end right of the given string value. Before introduction of string function in SQL Server 2017, it was possible to accomplish this task by using the combination of both Ltrim left and Ltrim right functions that were introduced in the world of SQL Server much more earlier. There was also a possibility to use a custom CL, CRL function, for example, using C sharp string trim, but this approach isn't probably the best and the quickest one. String aggregate function introduced in SQL Server version 2017 is for string aggregation. String aggregation is pretty much the opposite from string split described earlier. I know there are many theories, approaches, and solutions to aggregate data in SQL Server before the existence of string aggregate function. The one I prefer is using XML with stuff. Maybe this is not the optimal one, but we will not test them now. If you want to read more about different row concatenation methods before string aggregate, I suggest you to look at a good article by Enid Stan on Redgate Simple Talks. If you think that Translate has something in common with language translation, <laughs> that you are completely wrong. But it will be cool, of course. The function Translate replaces multiple characters inside a given string value. The function Translate cannot be used to replace a character with an empty string. This was possible using the older replace function in SQL Server. This is also possible in C Sharp by using string replace. Concat VS. MS SQL Server function concat is introduced in SQL Server version 2012. Simply as that, it returns a string that is the result of concatenating two or more string values. The new function concatVS is introduced in SQL Server 2017. ConcatVS concatenates a variable number of arguments within with a delimiter specified in the first argument, the separator. If you need the same separator between two or more strings, then concat vs is the command you are looking for. And let's see the second demo. SQL Server trim removes spaces from both sides of the string. So I have a string variable that actually has spaces before and after the string on the left and on the right side. And I am using the first, the old approach with L trim and R trim, and after that, only the trim. And the result is the same. SQL Server aggregate. It aggregates values in one string. Let's run it. So the input parameters are gene and tonic, and the result is gene and tonic. Let's see a real database example. I was trying to aggregate all the customer's name using string aggregate, and I get an error. Why? The reason for that is actually that customer name is an n varchar 100 column, and the result exceeded 8,000 bytes so SQL Server had an overflow. To accomplish this task, you must first cast the input parameter to n varchar max, and then the result will be n varchar max. And now we don't have the error anymore. What will happen if we try to aggregate null values? Let's check it out. So the null values are of course ignored and you will get the result string without them. And this is pretty much okay because the whole result will not be null. If you try, for example, to concatenate 
uh, to aggregate all invoices ID for a customer, you can accomplish this task by using, of course, string aggregate and group by. And here uh, in the resulted, you can see customer ID and all the invoices, invoices for this customer. But if we, we want to be sure that actually the invoice list is ordered by a specific criteria, then you must use the within group syntax followed by the order by syntax. Now, if we run this query, we will, we will be actually sure that the invoice list is ordered by some criteria. Let's check out the performance of string aggregate function. I will turn on statistics. The execution plan is already turned on. And I will use the old approach by using XML and stuff. And after that, I will try to aggregate the, the same string using string aggregate function. Let's run it. Let's check first the execution plan. So as you can see here, SQL Server thinks that actually the first query using XML take almost 100% of the whole query batch. Okay, this is not exactly true, but the first syntax used most of the query most of the time to complete. So actually the first query take CPU time of 110 milliseconds, while the second one was using only 31 milliseconds. This means that actually string aggregate is very efficient. Let's see the translate function. Translate function replace one or more characters with other characters in the string. So I will here replace the this character with this character and I will get the result. Okay, now let's try to replace every space with nothing. And what will happen? We will get an error, of course, because this is not supported. You, you must have the same number of characters on the second and the third parameter of the translate function. And to be able to achieve this, we could use the replace function. And this is more efficient than translate. But translate is more efficient compared to replace because, because it can replace many characters at once. So if you see this example here, you can see actually that here are specified more than one character that we want to replace. So every this bracket is replaced by this, and the second character or close bracket is replaced by this second character here. And before the existence of function translate, you were forced to use replace many times. So replace, replace. Imagine that you want actually to replace 10 characters, then you should use the function replace 10 times. And the last function in this demo is concat vs. So the old function concat before SQL Server 2017 was used actually to concatenate more than one input parameter or string. So this will not work, of course, because we must have at least two parameters. Right now in this demo, I will show you how to concatenate three values. 
So I have three values and I want to concatenate them. As you can see, for example, the cast is not needed by using the concat function. So the number int of value three is automatically converted to string. How will concat do the work with no values? The result will be pretty great because it will not be null and null value is just ignored and this is pretty cool. So for example, you can also generate drop statements for every table in the database using concat like before. Concat VS is a new function introduced in SQL Server 2017. So it takes at least three parameters, the delimiter and after the delimiter, one, two or more values that you want to concatenate. Let's see a working example. I will concatenate by using this character, the schema name, the name of a table and the type description of a table. And I will get a comma separated value, or maybe this is a CSV file valid. But what will happen if I have a one null value in this, one of these parameters is null, for example. As you can see, this parameter is completely ignored. And we, in this situation, have a problem because this is not anymore a valid CSV file. To get a valid CSV file, we must check with is now this parameter. And now this CSV file result is OK. Stig or binary data will be truncated. Sometimes this error message can be very frustrating and almost impossible to detect what insert statement or record is the cause of the issue. Imagine that we are trying to insert some values from another table or a complex select statement. But the Microsoft team did, did a great job in SQL Server 2019. Now we know some basic parameters of the error. Table in which the insert occurred, for example, in the table sum table, the destination column name, column call, and finally the value or part of the value that was the ca cause of the error. Truncated value is xxx. Just keep in mind that the error number changed from 8152 to 2000. 628. And if you, your code you refer to the old error number, you can turn off this feature by using the command you see on the screen. Before SQL Server 2019, storing some characters, example ASCII, in SQL Server was limited. SQL Server support Unicode characters in the form of nchar, nvarchar, and ntext data types that are using UTF-16 encoding. The penalty of this was that you need to pay the price for more storage and memory because you had to store all the data in Uni Unicode, UTF-16, even when you need only SC characters. UTF-8 is the dominant character encoding system for the World Wide Web, and it is used in over 90% of all web pages. UTF-8 database support allow application internalization without converting all strings to Unicode. UTF-8 support in SQL Server 2019 is implemented as new collations, and in total there are 1,000 553 new collations you can choose for a database. You can identify them because they finish with the UTF-8 suffix. 
we are trying to put the Russian translation of the phrase SQL Server 2019 supports UTF collation. And if Google Translate does not lie to us, it should sound like visible here. Non-UTF-8 database, notice that the result for the query where we are using the virtual data type is incorrect. We lose the Cyrillic characters. The characters are displayed correctly in the second query, the one with N virtual data type. UTF-8 database, the result, the result is now correct. We see the Cyrillic characters with both data types, varchar and varchar. Look also to the column data length value. You can notice that there is a slight improvement in the consumption of the space needed for storing Cyrillic characters using UTF-8 encoding. Let's see the demo. Let's see the error message in the old compatibility level of the database. I will create a test table and I will insert some strings. So string or binary data will be truncated. Thank you very much. Imagine that this result was by a large query, for example, and really I will have many problems to detect where the error actually occurred. Okay, now let's change the compatibility level of the database, create the same table, and let's try to insert a row. Now, the error is much better. Strung or binary data will be truncated in table. Word, why, word importers, DBO data is the table, column is last name, and truncated value or part of the name is Daniel. So actually, I can easily find in my query that this Daniels is the problem because the last name in the table was only a virtual six and Daniels is larger than that. UTF-8 support. Let's see all the available UTF-8 collations. As you can see, there are 1,553 collations and all are ending with UTF-8 in the name. Let's create some two test databases. One with UTF-8 support, this is the one, and the second one without the UTF-8 support. Let's use it. Let's run the two queries. So the first one without the UTF-8 support, when we try to display the Russian Cyrillic values, we will lose the values when using the virtual data type. But in the second example, when using the UTF-8 database, also the value is visible in the virtual data type. Of course, we can compare the data length of the two databases. So notice actually that the N varchar is using 78 char uh, characters, uh, sorry, bytes, and the varchar is using only 64. So we have actually some space saving here. And this is great. SQL Server Compress and the Compress are introduced in SQL Server version 2016. As you know, SQL Server already supports row and page compression of data, and Compress function isn't the replacement for them. The function returns the data type of our binary max that represent the compressed content of the input. The function uses gzip algorithm for data compression. Compressed data cannot be indexed. It is recommended to use it on rarely used data, 
maybe some log data or XML. Because the data is not simple, readable, or usable, if first not decompressed. On short text values, the compressed data could use more space than the original data. This is a normal behavior like the file compression of really small files. The compress should be the exact opposite of the compress mechanism, or maybe not. The function actually returns the data type of our binary max data type. If you like to get the original value, you must cast it in the original data type. So you must cast the data in the same data type before the compression. Otherwise, you will not be able to read the result. If, for example, you don't read so good the var binary format. Let's see the demo. Let's see the compression of this really big string. So this is actually the compressed string. And as you know from before, compress return the var binary max data type. Let's compare actually the efficiency or the compression rate. So the original site was 1152. The compressed size was 400. 35 and the compression rate is 62 percent but what will happen if we really have a small string to compress notice that actually the compressed size is larger than the original one so we have the compression rate ratio of minus 20 percent and this is of course normal let's see let's compare compress to row and page compression I will use uh, worldwide importers. I have prepared some test tables and I will not now uh, prepare again this table because it takes some time. I inserted a lot of records in this database, in these tables, <coughs> one without compression and one with compression. So the second one is compressed. Let's see examples so the first one is not compressed these are normal strings and the second one is actually compressed let's compare the first one uncompressed with first with uh, da data compression row after the data compression page and the third one with the compressed table and let's wait for the results Well, notice that actually the non-compression, not compressed table was using 43 megabytes. The raw compression is using 22 megabytes. The page compression is using 22 megabytes. And our compress function used 32 megabytes. So we gained something about that. Also, we will try, for example, to compress an XML document. I prepared two tables, one with normal XML and the second one with compressed XML. I inserted also rows and here you can see these rows. So the first table is uncompressed XML and the second one is compressed. And now let's compare the usage. In the first one, non-compressed XML, we are using 156 megabytes. And in the compressed one, we are using only 80 megabytes. And this is a large saving, but performance is not so good. Let's see the, comp the decompress. So I am first compressing one string and then decompressing it. And Notice that the end result is not readable. Why? Because the end result returns a data type of var binary. And to be able to read the result, I must cast the data in the original data type. So it should work like this. We started from 
this readable string and we finish with the readable string. But the cast is recommended, of course. And let's see one more example. What will happen here? We have an nvarchar for the input, but we are casting it as varchar only, without the n. And the result will be really strange. I get something that's really different. And the second example, where I am starting from varchar and finishing with the n varchar data type, I will get also a strange result. So be aware of that. You must use and know the original data types when using the compress. Otherwise, the result will not be good. Let's see some performance uh, of compressed and non-compressed data. I have uh, this my XML. The first one is not compressed. The second one is co compressed. And of course, I want to turn on statistics. And I would like to select the first one, ten, the first nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine rows from the first table and also from the second, but I want to the, the compress and cast this to the original value. And let's compare the performance. I am running this. This will take some small time to finish. And first, let's notice, let's look at the execution plan. So the non-compressed table, reading the non-compressed table, was using more resources actually than the second one with the compress. And this is actually not totally true. But let's analyze what happened and why SQL Server in the execution plan decided to give us these estimations. So the first non-compressed was using much more logical reads than the second one the compressed one. And this is actually why SQL Server told us that the first query was taking more resources, because the execution plan is mostly based on logical reads. But now let's compare the duration. The first query was taking only 109 milliseconds to finish, and the second one was using 7 100 milliseconds. So from my point of view, the second query is not so efficient because of the decompress process. And that's all about compress and decompress. Let's return to our slides. Enter Alter is a new Microsoft SQL Server syntax extension introduced from SQL Server 2016. After many years, SQL Server introduced the possibility to create or alter an object depending if the object already exists or not. Currently supported objects type by create or alter are store procedures, functions, triggers, views. Drop if exist is also a new SQL Server syntax extension introduced from SQL Server 2016. You can remember a lot of situations when you need to drop an object for example, when using temp tables or stop procedures, there are often situations you want to drop an object. So now we have a new drop if exist statement, which is basically a conditional drop statement. Still as before, you can run it only if you have adequate permissions. If the object exists and you don't have adequate permissions, you will get no error message. The, re the reason for that is that the drop if exists simply suppress the error message. Currently supported objects types by drop if exists are many of them. For example, aggregate, procedure, table, assembly, role, trigger, etc. Data diff big. In, sh in short, it is introduced in 
Sickle Cell 2016. Date, date diff big is almost the same function as date diff starting from Sickle Cell 2008 that is commonly used already. The function returns a big int value representing the count of the specified date part units cross between the specified start date and end date. The main difference between the date diff and the date diff big is as you can notice in the big part of the name. It is almost the true because while date diff returns a value of type int, the date diff big returns big int. Date diff big function can handle much bigger values than the date diff function. Also, with date diff big, you can get the overflow error, but it's harder to get it. It can be used with the, with, within the columns or the select statement, but also in the where having group by and order by clauses. Hash byte. So what is hashing? <coughs> in short words, hashing is a process of generating a value or values from a string of text using a mathematical function. SQL Server function hash bytes was introduced in SQL Server 2005 and it supported only MD2, MD4, MD5, SHA and SH1 hashing algorithms. From SQL Server 2012, additionally, the SHA2256 and 512 algorithms were introduced. Prior to SQL Server 2016, the input value was limited to 8,000 bytes. Now the limit does not exist anymore and you can use the nvarchar or var binary max input data type. Starting with SQL Server 2016, all algorithms other than the SHA2256 or 512 are deprecated. They will continue to work, but only the last two are recommended for usage. Let's see the demo of these features. Let's try to create a store procedure that already exists. Or maybe does not exist. Okay, if the store procedure already exists, we get an exception. This can be easily solved by writing this code here. So first we will check if the object does exist. If does exist, then we will drop it. And then after that, recreate it. And now the error is gone. But much elegant solution is introduced in SQL Server by using create or alter syntax. So now, if the object already exists, it will be only altered, and if does not exist, it will be created. Let's drop this procedure. procedure. Drop if exist, akadai. I will try to drop some new function table. And of course, I will get an error. So the old way to solve this problem is, of course, first we will check if this object does exist. And if yes, then we will drop it. No error, of course, here. But by using drop if exist, this is working pretty much well, also without checking the existence of the object. Thanks to Ernold Somarskog, he has a nice example for us. We'll create actually two tables. We'll create a user and give him only the select right on one table. We will execute the following script as this user. So let's try to drop the three tables. Remember, one is not existing and the other two are there, but the user has only select rights on one of these tables. And we, of course, like we wanted, we get three error messages. 
what will happen if we are using the new syntax drop if exist? Can you guess it maybe? So I was actually hoping to not get error messages, but it's not the case. We will get one error message for the table that you can actually here see, and the user has only the select rights on this table. So drop if exist is not actually working for that user. Okay, let's revert it and I will drop the free tables. Date diff big. So date diff is working okay. For example, if we are get trying to select the difference of one day interval and until we are on milliseconds, all is working well. But if we try, for example, to select the difference in microseconds, we will get an overflow. Why? Because the date diff is using the int data type and microseconds difference of one day is larger than int. So we can accomplish this by using the new date diff big. And now the microseconds is supported and also nanosecond difference of one day. So date diff big help us to use much larger data difference. Fish bytes. So let's try to hash one string. We will get the hash. Of course, hash bytes has two arguments. First is the hashing algorithm and the string we want to hash. Let's see all the supported hashing algorithms in SQL Server. Notice that actually they are different in the data length generated. So the resulting string, or actually it's not a string, but is as I told you before, var binary data type, it's much, much larger for better hashing algorithms. And all algorithms except these two are deprecated. They are still working in SQL Server, but please don't use them. What is a salt? Usually in C-sharp code, when you are hashing things, you can use the salt. And meaning that every time that you will run a hashing on the same string, you will get the different result or the different hashed value. But in SQL Server, you cannot actually use the salt and the two resulting values are completely the same. What if you are trying to hash different data types? So it's the same string, but hashed twice. First time it was n varchar, second time is only var varchar. And the resulting string is different. So take in consideration, when hashing different data types, you will get different hashes for same strings. And hashing is sometimes very useful when comparing values in two tables. So imagine you have two tables with almost same records and you want to fast compare these records. You can achieve this task by creating a hashed value column and compare records by only using hashed value column. So here you can see the whole value of a customer record hashed. I created this by using hash bytes and selecting start from invoices and invoices lines for one customer in XML, and after that, the XML value is hashed. And if I have, for example, two systems, the hash value is pretty fast to compare, but of course, it's better to store it in some 
table and just to compare already calculated value. So here is the example you can see about that. So this is a table actually, and if you are looking only on a hashed value, you will see then these two records are completely the same, and also the last two records are completely the same because the hashed value is the same for these records. And so it's easy actually to compare records in a table. SQL Server 2016 introduced support for JSON. The main question is, why would we support and use JSON in SQL Server? Like XML, JSON is a standard and it should be supported. Other vendors support it, like for example Oracle, PostgreSQL and others. And some of them, such as PostgreSQL, are very serious and robust. Many different frameworks in these days support JSON. For example, web services, applications, etc. Pretty much like creating XML data in SQL Server using the 4XML clause, in SQL Server we can use 4JSON clause in the select statement. There are two modes supported by the 4JSON clause 4JSON auto. The JSON output will be formatted automatically. For JSON path, the JSON output will be formatted by the query itself using aliases, and its purpose is to create more complex outputs like nested objects. We have three additional options. The first one is include null values. Normally, null values are not mapped to a JSON property. Root. Similar to the 4xml root option, you can use the root option to add a single top-level element to the JSON output. And the third one is without array wrapper. Using the without array wrapper option, we can format the result as a single object. We will show this in an, an example. To cast JSON data to SQL, we can use the open JSON. It returns an object that can be used just like a normal table or view. Depending on the usage, it can return data into two possible ways. The first one is with default schema, and the second one is with explicit schema. The first one with default schema, when the schema of course is not specified, and the second one is a user-defined schema, meaning the return columns are defined by the user. When you don't specify the schema for the re returned result, the OpenJSON function returns a table with three columns, key, value, and type. The key column, this is the name of the JSON property or the index of a JSON element. The data type of the column is nvarchar4000, and the column does not allow null values. The value column, this is the value of the property or index defined by the key column. The data type of this column is n varchar max. Nulls are allowed. And the type, the JSON data type of the value. The data type of the column is tiny int. You can see in this table possible values for this column and appropriate descriptions. Open JSON with explicit schema, something similar like reading XML data in SQL Server. We can specify our own schema when reading JSON data. In this case, the function will also return a table, but the output columns and their data types can be specified by the user. The schema for the JSON data can be specified using the optional with key keyword at the end of the open JSON function. Let's see a small demo about JSON support in SQL Server. So let's try to convert a SQL data in JSON by using JSON Auto. Let's try to select 
and we will get an exception. The reason for that is that actually if, if we are using for JSON auto, a table is required. So let's give to the SQL table and then select something in JSON by using JSON auto. To this be more readable, I will paste it here. And here you can see a nice JSON object with an array of customers completely converted to JSON format. And this is great. Okay. For JSON path, if you are using JSON path, the table is not required anymore, of course. And we can create more complex data type. So here is one example of that. Notice. If we look at this JSON document, we will see that actually the our customer now has a contact object that has phone and fax value here. We accomplish this task by specifying or by using aliases. So, for example, phone number is contact dot phone or full stop contact dot fax and SQL Server, when you are using the JSON path, will convert this in more complex objects. How is JSON in SQL handling null values? Here we have two records with null values. And when I show you these documents, you will see actually that the null values are totally ignored. So the website URL does not exist in the customer number two and five because it was null. We can get null values by using the optional include null values option. If include null values option is included, then of course, in the resulting document, you will see that now the website URL is included even if the value is null. Let's turn to the management studio. Uh, the second optional is the root node. So let's write. We'll get then JSON object. And now notice that it has a customer's root object specified. This is why, because we told to the engine, put a root node with customers. We can also use the optional without a rev wrapper. So remember that every JSON document until now had a array wrapper around. This is the one here. And now <clears throat> with using the without array wrapper, the array wrapper is ignored. So we get a document without the parentheses. Let's return. Open JSON with default schema. If we are using the select star from open JSON and the schema is not specified, we will get three columns always, the key, the value, and the type. And the type is a numeric representation of the type. For example, one is string, two is number, zero is null, and etc. We can also select some no nodes in JSON by specifying the path here. So in the first example, we didn't specify the path. In the second one, we will specify that we want to get only the parent node. And this is the result of this, because we have here the parents and the path was specified that we would want to retrieve only the parents node. Okay, let's see the open JSON with the explicit schema. So meaning that the schema is specified by the developer. So it's similar to XML. Select star from open JSON 
width and the schema is here. So the name is on the path.name, the blog URL is on dot blog URL, etc. Let's select this. And now the result is not anymore the three column table, as you remember before, but now it's a nice table that you actually want to use if you are, for example, importing JSON documents into your tables. JSON value is a function that will extract only the JSON value from a JSON document. Notice, for example, that the non-existing node is returned now because it does not exist and also the suppose is now so is returned as now. JSON value is able only to return basic types so strings, numbers, boolean values etc. If you want to extract a JSON object then you must use the JSON query like in this Example, JSON query allows you to extract complex data types, only complex data types. So as you can see in this example, only the favorite colors is actually returned because this is the complex data type. All other values here are not complex, are simple and are returned like now. You have the function is JSON. This JSON will, will tell you actually if the document is a valid JSON document or not. So notice here, if the input parameter is null, you will get the null. If you send the incorrect JSON document, then you will get zero. And if you send for the parameter the correct JSON document you will get one you can for example use json to process data from comma separated list of values and it's pretty simple but it's not so bulletproof and you must be aware actually that the document must be well formatted so the second example will not pass and finally i will show you a nice feature of using JSON in SQL Server. In this example, we have one table with two records, and this table is Sys Databases table. It has 86 columns actually. And somebody <clears throat> come to you and tell you, give me only the columns in one table for two rows that are different and I want to know what are the different values. By using JSON, this, is, this task is a piece of cake. We just run this comment, and you will actually see that in, in the Sys databases, the master and the model database are different only in these nine values. All other values are identical, and this is really one cool feature of using JSON. I will not show you more about JSON now because I have the whole session of one hour about JSON in details. So for this session, this is all about JSON. So thank you very much for watching my session. It was really a pleasure to be selected as a speaker for this great event. Thank you, special thanks to the sponsors, especially to Microsoft for supporting Data Platform Summit. And also thank you all for attending this great conference one more time. There are of course three ways to win prizes as you can see on this slide. Thank you one more time for having me as a speaker and have a nice rest of this day. Bye-bye.